came up with the title to this talk and spent most of my time uh, making the photo slide look like How I Met Your Mother, which I have never seen. <laughs> anyway, so um, I've seen like half of an episode. Um, so, you know, I, my name is Mara Averick. I am the Tidyverse developer advocate at our studio, which we're not sure what that means. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so how I found your answer. Let's talk about that. Um, by running your code. So that's all I have. And <laughs> ah, all right, fine, I cracked myself up. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, please note this is not to scale. This is something I was thinking of the other week in a Tidyverse meeting um, when somebody put up a slide and Gabor was like, oh, sorry, I was just running that code in my head. And I was like, oh, like I do all the time. Not at all. I don't have. Yeah, so when you have a question, like, Here's the universe of people who can help you fix your code. Uh, down here, like people who can run code in their head, and uh, all the way over there is like people who will answer your question without running the code first. And uh, that's something that it turns out like people who are new to programming don't necessarily begin. If you don't believe me or think I know anything because I'm not cool. Even Jenny Bryan is like, caveat, I did not run your code. People run your code when you ask them a question because they want to make sure it's right. Um, and I kind of started talking about this stuff uh, a, about a year ago. And um, this slide and the one before is, you know, like, first of all, this is actually true. Like, that is, I have fielded a GitHub issue that, that said it doesn't work um, and also had our template for an issue. Which was really helpful. So you've got a problem, and uh, it doesn't work, except oh, structure better. no one's going to be able to find your answer based on that. So you're like, oh, they're going to need more information. But there's this newcomer's paradox, right? So like, when you're new to something, you don't have the words necessarily to, to solve your problem. And then somebody's like, oh, like just do foobar and baz. And you're like, I don't know what that means. And I ran question mark foo. And it's not even helping me in the function reference. So uh, these past two slides, I've been, that was also a joke. It's not a function. Um, so these two slides I've been thinking about for a while. And um, kind of between, between then and now, what changed for me is that uh, I've read, actually, I looked at this yesterday since I made this slide two weeks ago. It's now 29.2 thousand questions on uh, the RStudio community. So it turns out there are, um, there, there are <laughs> it's a lot. Uh, there are a lot of things that you kind of have to think about. And you have to tell somebody when you want an answer that it, apparently not everyone knows and that I didn't necessarily know. Um, and the thing is, is that the context in which you're asking your question matters, right? So like different environments have different norms. Um, also, I like Archer. <laughs> um, so let's talk about like three different areas in which you can ask for help, all of which are good. Like Twitter is like hashtag our stats, like does this package exist or like not like an in-depth coding question, or if you just want to know like who might know about this, go for it. Um, Stack Overflow is has a really specific model that is incredibly helpful, um, but again, it's really specific. So um, the goal of Stack Overflow, right, is to have um, basically unique, good question and answer pairs on the internet. Um, and this was a flowchart that uh, was in Meta Stack Overflow saying, like, how do you respond to RTFM questions, which, for those of you who don't know, is read the flipping manual. Um, and it's kind of like, can it be found with a simple Google search? You know, like, but basically, there are like three outcomes here. Like, you can answer the question, you can improve it, or you can close it. Um, the thing is, when you're a beginner, you don't always know exactly what your question is to start out with. Um, and as somebody who isn't a beginner, you might be able to help somebody, but you don't necessarily know the entire answer for a self-contained, uh, that's like the goal of a Stack Overflow question is that it be self-contained, have your resources, but you might be able to you know, put them in the right direction. Um, so our studio community has been around for about a year. 
Um, it uses a platform called Discourse, which was uh, made by Jeff Atwood, who also did Stack Overflow. Um, and it's a civilized discussion for your community. The platform itself uh, looks like this. Um, and it lends itself to a different kind of discussion. Um, certainly a lot of question and answer, but also things are a bit more kind of free form. And there's, I spend a lot of time kind of helping people to write a good question so that they can get the answer. Um, and what I've found in the past year or so of doing that um, is that it's actually really beneficial. So what's in it for me, as in uh, you? So not me. If you're asking yourself this question, you're asking what's in it for me. Um, and I'm recommending that you help people answer questions, which like feels kind of Mr. Miyagi getting his car waxed. Don't worry, I took out the Mike Tyson slide. <laughs> um, but the thing that you end up discovering is that like you end up getting better at your own troubleshooting skills by helping other people, um, which is valuable. And there's a lot of advice on uh, how to ask a question. This is from a paper um, that was published in a year that I don't know. Um, 10 simple rules for getting help from online scientific communities. You don't have to read this whole thing, but number one is like, don't be afraid to ask a question. And like the subtext of two through 10 is like, be slightly afraid about asking your question. <laughs> Granted, like, I am on the other side of this. Like, I, it can be really hard, but um, you also have to have like a certain amount of empathy for the user. Um, so let's think. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you guys some good things about asking questions, and then some thoughts I have on you know how do people help people how to ask their questions. Um, so it turns out actually like the anatomy of doing this isn't really unique to programming. So for a GitHub issue, we talk about like, all right, the problem description, the expected behavior, and a minimal reproducible example. Um, and that is like GitHub saying that, so it's official. But uh, it turns out this is like basically the anatomy of figuring shit out. So like in, uh, in my mom's a psychologist, and like in behavior therapy, they call this the ABC. So you're looking at the antecedents, the behaviors, and the consequences. Um, an example of this that I found online that I just love this kid, which is like, all right, what was the antecedent? Circle time, singing days of the week. Behavior kicks other student. Consequence, time out. Possible function, escape. Circle time, singing days of the week. Kicks two students. Like if we're doing a linear model, I've got some guesses about what's going to but like the, the point of, of writing this, I really got to respect the hell out of that kid. Um, you know, like the, the point here is that like you're breaking down an issue and it's easy to get caught up in the technical elements of that being like, I don't understand this, I don't understand that. But really, like think about the information that you would need to like open your car door or do another normal human thing to sit through the days of the week song. And why were you trying to do it? This is like a huge thing that uh, people often forget to describe. Like, oh, this is why I was trying to do this thing. When you say it doesn't work, it's very um, helpful if you say why you were trying to do that thing. So, um, you know, like, how does this work out? If we give people that anatomy, does it all go PT keen? This is a very real issue that was filed. Um, steps taken so far, I tried and tried. And the thing is, they're not wrong, you know, like technically speaking, but that's also not the information that's going to help me or anyone find your answer. Um, I like this quote by Karl Popper, like it's impossible to speak in such a way that you cannot be misunderstood. That question was probably just asked to illustrate this quotation. Um, turns out writing prose about code is really hard. Um, and if you think about what's going on here, like dude over there 
Chad, like wrote some code. Now he's thinking about it. He thinks about it. He's like, this is what I just did. And then he writes a long thing describing what he did. Like, and then I had this for lunch. And my boss yelled at me. And like, I wrote one of those squiggly dots. And like, you're like, oh. And then like Marna, my alter ego, <laughs> over here is like interpreting that. And I'm like, oh, is a squiggle dot a semicolon? Is it a snake? Whatever, and then I'm writing an answer back in code, being like, and then press the third button to, like, if you think about this from a computational standpoint, there's a lot of, like, interpretation, evaluation, and then, like, there's a lot of room for errors in there. Um, so sometimes people are asking a question, this is kind of, like, this is what it feels like. You know, like, they're asking me for a question, I'm asking them for more information, and saying, like, no, I'm withholding it. Look at me getting off. But the reality is, <laughs> It's really more like, I don't understand the question and I won't respond to it. Um, it's, it's no, no one's being withholding. There's just only so much you can do when uh, you're given limited information. So enter magic of reprex. So it stands for reproducible example. Um, and before I tell you what it is, let me tell you like the raison d'etre is help me help you. Um, I think. I've seen a lot of people feel like they're like, everyone here is just asking me to make a reprex. I already had a problem, and now I have a reprex problem. The reality is, like, it is to, it is to help us help you. So um, what I found when helping people, this is like the meta helpfulness, is that like, I go with basically a three-pronged strategy approach. It's like, all right, what I'm asking you to do, I'm asking you to make a reproducible example, why I'm asking you to do it, and how you can do the thing. Um, so let's talk about the thing. The keys to rep excellence. I'm into a good portmanteau. So what you need is code that actually runs, code that doesn't have to be run, and code that can be easily run. Um, which, hence my intro song, I naturally thought of this to the tune of Rap God. <laughs> You guys should really hear Mr. Boombastic, heteroscedastic, if that's another talk. Yeah, so like, for a reprex, you need your packages, you need your objects, and I'm asking you for this for the flipping context. I didn't actually mean for that to rhyme as much as it did. Um, so what's the point of doing all of this? Well, what reprex does is it basically runs our markdown render on your code, if you have everything there, and then if I'm reading your code, like I can see your error message. I can see what code you ran, I can see what you were using, and then I can take it and run it myself, and I can help you, which was what you were aiming for, I hope. Um, and I did not play that GIF before, so now you can see that in action. Even cooler, in my humble opinion, is the fact that Reprex also is amazing for troubleshooting issues that involve uh, plotting, because it automatically, like literally this is on your clipboard, you cut and paste it in, I can see everything you did. This issue was written by Klaus Wilke when we had an issue with the uh, line height, <laughs> and you can see he did a very good job of keeping it minimal. Um, and depending on where you're at in your R journey, you may be able to see like, you can see exactly what is happening there and you don't need to do any of this kind of like push and pull. Um, when I'm answering a question, I, I'm not Hadley, but like I try and leave like a little bit of a treasure trail of like how I found the information. You know, so Hadley here saying like, what did I do? I looked in the S book. I went to the R source mirror. I found the relevant part. I saw the history, and then I sent an email. Um, the use of that is that then next time somebody has a question, or the next time you have a question, has anyone else here? had a question and then read their own answer on, um, yeah. I'm always like, who is that smart cookie or moron? And I'm like, it was me. Yikes. Um, so that's one thing that you're kind of guiding people through this. Like, it, it, may be, it may feel obvious to you, but if you're a newcomer, you don't know where things are. So, or if you're yourself in a year. Reading error messages. Um, that was something I did not do for a long time. I think I just read an error message as being like super obnoxious and scary and that I broke it. 
Um, and this one is an excellent example of there being like super useful information. This literally says like configuration failed because this, like this is what you have to do. But if you are in like error messages or super scary mode, you probably didn't read it. Um, so what I end up doing sometimes is like per the error message, which sounds a little bit obnoxious, but like this might be that person's first time ever seeing a useful error message. Like I, I don't know if I don't know if you guys have deleted your Fortran compilers by accident, but I sure have. And like the errors that you get are not usually it's like again, damn squiggly marks. Um, so I'm circling back here to RTFM. Like seriously guys, read a book. Um, when you write a package and you write documentation and all of that and you know where it is, it's really easy to feel this way. You're like, I just wrote this out. Um, and I have seen many times like the response like, it's in writing our extensions. Well, here's the freaking manual. <laughs> oh, just read that. Um, a step away, uh, helpfully, uh, Colin Fay formatted all of the uh, R manuals as book down, which is step in the right direction. You could say, go read this slightly prettier manual. Um, or you can really guide people through the docs. And uh, that's, this is something that I try and do, um, in part just as a way of modeling like what is helpful behavior. Being like, here's where I found a thing. And some other things. Um, and this kind of model of helping people ask good questions through responding in a certain way was something that uh, there's a great paper written called We Don't Do That Here. Uh, or, yeah. And it was, uh, they did a test pilot from Stack Overflow where the, essentially they had like a room that helped people to ask better questions. Um, and what the mentors helped people improve on was like, you know, phrase your question title better, being like, my boss is going to kill me. SOS, emoji, like, I don't even know what your question is. All I see is those characters, and that might be all you literally see. Um, formatting, so when code and text are interspersed, hard to read. Community triage, this is very legit. Like, if you're filing, like, I, like I've been working on this and this isn't going that well on GitHub, probably not the right place. But being like, here is the right place, or like, I, I do it on Twitter all the time. If somebody asks me a code question, I'm like, oh, can you come ask me this on community? Because I only have 280 characters to answer it and code doesn't fit in there. Framing the question and then uh, like for Stack Overflow, like the uh, FYI, like kind of the culture of asking is like, we don't say um, like, thank you or, you know, like, cause that's signal noise, but you get a sense for that. Um, quick tips I have like avoid a major data dump, like what I think I'm doing is being like, oh, look, look at all the packages and manuals we have. What they think I'm doing is like, great, I should read everything. Um, and I do try to use our trigger, I mean, I do try to slowly guide people ultimately to source code, um, which you don't always have to get to, but in about a year of reading a lot of source code, I can tell you there is really useful stuff in there. Um, and taking out bits and pieces and showing people how you got to the point where you could find their answer is a really powerful thing. Um, there's part of this that's about giving back. Um, excellent piece of literature here, thanklessly maintaining open source software doing it out of the goodness of your heart or something. But I am super into um, being selfish because I think that is where like the free and open source software happy place resides. So I, sometimes I'm on Twitter and I tweet things and I totally do that because those are the things I'm reading and I want to be able to keep track of them. It turns out that's been helpful for other people, but that's like a side benefit. <laughs> um, so. I think that answering questions and asking questions are both really valuable. Um, and I think that if you take an approach to it where you're breaking things down, you're gonna be able to solve your own problems better um, and you're gonna be able to help other people solve their problems. Everyone has kind of come up and talked about amazing things today that I wanna go try out and I'm probably gonna break something while doing it and I hope that somebody will help me out. So um, kind of try, try and feed back into the 
feed that back into the community so we can all do more cool things because holy shit, you geeks are badass. That's it.